Just by quick show of hands, how many people here have gambled on a sporting event in, in their lives ever? <laughs> yeah, pretty good amount. Uh, now, how many people here have done it legally in a state that's not Nevada? <laughs> okay, so a significantly fewer amount of people. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, sure, horse racing does not count for, for that one. Um, and that makes sense, right? We're, we're sitting in, in New York State, a state that you know, does not currently offer a le legal avenue. Um, and I want to start there because you know, the title of this conference is The Year Ahead, and New York is a perfect kind of encompassment of, of what the next year potentially holds in, in sports gambling. Um, and Sarah, let's start with you because you guys have been so instrumental in both in the Supreme Court change and then also kind of state by state. Uh, give us kind of a rundown of where you see New York uh, in the next 12 months. Yeah, so if you look at the country right now in the landscape, we just actually added our eighth state. Rhode Island went live yesterday with legalized, regulated sports betting. So, you know, the way that we view the country and the next states that are going to most likely come up, it happens in clusters. So I do anticipate New York did debate this um, earlier this year during their legislative session. There has since been a lot more conversation about what a framework could look like. So I do anticipate that New York will likely move this coming legislative session. And how important, Scott, is New York when you think about the state-by-state -state landscape? Obviously, a lot of people, a number of professional teams, including two NBA teams. Kind of, How do you rank it, and where does it fit in, in the, the patchwork of the country? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> New York's obviously very important. And in addition to being one of the most populous states in the country, as <clears throat> As you mentioned, there are several teams there. Uh, most of the leagues are headquartered in New York. It's a, it's a state with a long history of gaming experience. And it's been a battleground state for, for other forms of sports gaming, like daily fantasy. So I think there's some, some parallels there. And so we think it's very important. And, and I would also note that you know, last year, when the session uh, in New York session, as Sarah mentioned, there was a lot of discussion about this. And it was, it was really interesting that all the stakeholders really came to the table. Um, you know, the gaming industry, the regulators, the leagues were all able to sit around a table and say, how do we come up with a bill that could work for everyone? Um, unfortunately, the clock ran out and we weren't able to get anything passed last session. And I agree with Sarah. I think that it will be taken up again very quickly in the next session, as it will be in many states. Um, but I think it's an interesting case study that there's opportunity for all the stakeholders to come together and find legislation that can work. And um, so operators want New York, obviously, leagues want New York. In your conversations with investors, the, the, the outside money that is thinking about getting in here, how important is New York in kind of the, the, the calculus that they're doing? It's hugely important. I think when, when PASPA was first repealed, there was a lot of uh, excitement about the upside uh, opportunity. And then when people st stepped back, they actually did their homework and figured it's up to AGA and others, to actually the NBA, to go and go state by state uh, and, and fight the little battles. And, and I think now people are starting to see the momentum. Getting a state like New York would be massive, right? Then people say, okay, what's up with Florida? What's up with California, right? But if you're a public market investor, it's not next quarter, right? It's gonna be years before you get all those states. If we think about the ideal New York legislation, uh, I know the two of you guys on that couch uh, would agree on most of it. Uh, there's a little bit that I think you disagree on. Uh, I don't wanna get too into the weeds on it, but real quick, kind of give me both of you kind of the, the pitch for, for the way that you see the ideal law moving forward. Yeah, I, I mean, as Scott said, you know, I, I represent the casino gaming industry, and there is more that we agree on with the leagues than we disagree on. Um, certainly when it comes to the economics, that's been a point of contention. Um, there's been this proposal for an integrity fee, which was as high as 1% of handle, which is the total amount that's bet before Winners would be paid out before taxes would be paid, before employees would be paid, before advertising would be paid. And we basically said, look, if you want the operators to be able to compete with the illegal market, which is a, a shared goal of both of us, we simply are not going to be able to do that under that kind of legislative framework. So we do have differences when it comes to that integrity fee. But I think for most of the part, we do align when it comes to reasonable tax rates promoting the integrity of the game, pr protecting the consumer. So, and another huge piece of this, and not um, something I think that's been talked about enough, is the processing of financial transactions. I mean, that's a huge, huge issue. The more friction points that the consumer has when they're placing bets, the harder it's going to be then to move those people that are betting on the illegal market to the legal regulated one. 
Yeah, and, and from our perspective, I certainly agree with Sarah. There, there's a lot that we agree on, the, the consumer protections, responsible gaming provisions, and <clears throat> giving, a, giving everyone the tools to protect the integrity of our competitions, which is always at the forefront of what we're thinking about when it comes to sports betting. But there are those one or two issues. And on the economics, you know, it's, it's the position of the leagues that you know, the government's going to be passing a law that's going to allow a third party, to, and in most cases a casino, to generate revenue off of our competitions. And we think it's reasonable that we participate in that. And, you know, there are other examples across the world where there's precedent for this. You know, we've seen it in Australia, we've seen it in France, and we've also actually seen it here in the U.S. A gentleman over here mentioned horse racing. That's very similar to how the Interstate Horse Racing Act works, is if you are going to place a bet, you know, if you have an OTB or a mobile wagering app and you're going to place a bet on a particular race, you have to have an agreement with the host track. So, you know, from our perspective, we feel like if someone's going to profit off of our competitions, we should participate in that. And um, we feel it's a reasonable position. And as we look at the, the next 12 months, New York and Illinois feel like the two biggest states that are likely or possibly likely to, to legalize. How important are those two states for both of you guys in essentially trying to achieve the things that you're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, it, it always comes down to numbers, right, and consumers and how many people are going to be in a state. Since this is going to be limited to intrastate, it's not interstate, certainly when it comes to mobile. So Illinois and New York are, are huge. But, you know, I'd also mention that Michigan is a real possibility. Ohio is a real possibility. Indiana is a real possibility. The District of Columbia, who would have thought? Um, <laughs> that I think that's probably going to get done this year. So it's honestly, it is anyone's guess as to what the next states are. If you had asked me two years ago how quickly I thought this was going to move, I would never have guessed how fast things are moving. So I've worked eight in, right now, right? Yeah, I mean, I've worked yeah. in the gaming industry for 12 years. I've worked on some extraordinarily complex gaming legislation. It takes years, usually, for these things to get done, and it's moving at a clip that is unprecedented. Scott, I've also been impressed at the speed with which leagues have moved. I mean, it seems as though, you know, the, you guys were on the other side of the Supreme Court decision, and in six quick months, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, a lot of partnerships coming. The NBA announced one today, a, a data deal with Sport Radar and Genius Sports. Um, have you been surprised by how quickly states are going or how quickly the NBA itself is, is moving? Well, from our perspective, our position has evolved over the last 25 years. Hmm. Um, you know, to your point, in 1992, we were proponents of PASPA because at that time, we thought the best way to protect the integrity of our competitions was a federal prohibition. But over a 25-year period with the advent of the internet and smartphones, it just became increasingly e easy to bet illegally. And what we saw developing was this large, vibrant offshore market, some estimated to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And we really took a fresh look when our new commissioner took office in 2014 we took a fresh look and said, is this still the best way to protect our games? And we realized that given the amount of offshore betting, it would be better if it was in a regulated market where it could be monitored, taxed, and we could be a part of it. And so, um, you know, I think for us, it's been gradual. We, at the time in 2014, we asked for a federal framework, and that continues to be our preference, but there's not as much activity at the federal <laughs> government right now. And so <laughs> the, the, the conversation is happening at the state level, and so we're engaging in discussions at the state level. And I think commercial partnerships for us was the next natural uh, progression of that. And so we announced a deal with MGM, uh, our first partnership with a sports betting company um, anywhere in the, in the world. Uh, that, that was in July. And then just this morning, we announced that we are doing data distribution deals in the US with both Genius Sports and Sport Radar um, to ensure that our official data, which we think is uh, essential for sports betting, is distributed as widely as possible and that there's a competitive market for it. Don, you do a lot of work in the gaming space beyond just the sports betting piece. How many conversations do you have that don't include? sports gambling at this point in the in the gaming world very few yeah in the gaming world or in the sports world in the gaming world the gaming world no there's a lot of activity around sports betting but there's other issues mm. uh, and you, you're gonna be very familiar with all those <laughs> uh there's things around what's going on with china uh which is you know dragging down lots of the stocks you're seeing lots of activism uh in in the gaming world but every meeting i go to there's some discussion of mm. what are you doing on sports betting right if you go to a board session you'll see the agenda somewhere on there, there's a discussion or an update 
uh, what's going on with sports betting. And to put it in perspective, I was looking at the the the, the year past year uh, numbers from the Vegas uh, Gaming Control Board. Uh, Vegas casinos kept thirty two billion dollars uh, or eighty six billion or million off of football, eighty six million, ninety eight million off of basketball, uh, three point two billion off of penny stocks. Yeah. Or penny slots, yes. uh, 1.2 billion off of blackjack, yeah. yes. right? So there's a whole order of magnitude, yes. even right. or even more than that. Right. Difference for some casinos, a lot of the groups in the AGA there. Yeah. In terms yeah. of what they're profiting off of. Yeah, and, and then it gets back to sort of what's the best policy model that you can put in place then in order for the industry to thrive and compete with the illegal market. I mean, holistically speaking, if you look at Nevada and what the typical hold has been, it's been around five percent. This is. When you look at all the gambling that's happening in the state of Nevada, you just rattled through those numbers, but the sports betting is 2% of gross gaming revenue. So it is a very, very, very tiny piece of our gaming business operations. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a multitude of things that we're gonna benefit from by adding Sportsbook. We're going to have new customers. I mean, you look at some of the deals now that are being struck, they make a lot of sense. They make a lot of sense in getting new customers, attracting new new people to your, your casinos who also play table games, who also stay in the hotel, who buy food and beverage. So it is definitely a rising tide is going to lift all boats for the casino industry. But I would argue that on the sports side of this, it's an enormous opportunity through TV rights deals and merchandise and sponsorship. So it, it is going to benefit both of us. Um, and that's why you know we do view this as a good opportunity for us to try and work in partnership as quickly as possible to get more states open quickly. Yeah, I think one of the things that really interests me about this space is that every stakeholder has different reasons for doing what they're doing, right? So if we take a company like M MGM, you know, the deal that the NBA signed with MGM, marketing partnership, MGM wants that because they have property all over the world. You know, they have hotels, they have uh, casinos, they have event spaces, you know, and, and it really it means something to them to help, you know, partnerships that help them push those properties. A company like DraftKings doesn't have any of those things. No hotels, no casinos, no, no event spaces. Uh, so they're approaching things a little bit differently. When do you think we're going to see non-endemics, if it will, whether it's a media company, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Amazon, there's so many companies out there, tech companies or media companies, that feel like they would slot into this world fairly easily. I, mean, I can tell you everybody's doing work. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we are meeting with people in all those categories and more uh, who want to understand what's going on and how they play. Part of what they're doing is they're sort of waiting to see how the world settles, right? So is an MGM going to part with the GVC? What's the NBA doing? What's the NFL doing? The media guys are all watching mm. uh, and they're getting smart. Uh, and some are further out there than others, but they're all doing a lot of work. And what do you think that looks like when let's say NBC decides to, you know, we're doing this. There's some threshold questions. The two that we talk to them about all the time is, what's your brand? Are you going to use your brand? Right? Because there's a little bit of a friction there, right? If you're NBC, you love your brand. But if you're MGM, you also love your brand. Mm. And then I think the biggest one is licensing. Yep. Uh, and do you want to be a licensed uh, operator? Lots of them look at Skybet over in the UK. Right, and you look at the, the growth of that business, and they say, "Okay, I can I can replicate that. I've got this. I've got similar assets." Skybet being a company that has a big media arm and also the big media arm, and they use that to build a to to, to build a, a gambling business. The problem is you have to get licensed, and yeah. some of these media companies may not want to go through that. And so that's the debate, and so that may change how those deals look. Mm -hmm. Sarah, for your constituents, the casinos out there, kind of how do they view their Monopoly is not the right word, but their their, <laughs> their presence in this in this industry versus what it might be if other yeah. I, this is an in. instance where I would say you know regulation is definitely our friend. Um, it is a very the casino industry is an incredibly highly regulated industry, a very very high threshold for entering. Being licensed is a privilege. You can have your license revoked at any time. So what Don is talking about is there's not a lot of companies that are jumping in to go through. What our, my guys refer to as a proctology exam because <laughs> essentially that's what it is. You're handing over, you're signing away your constitutional rights and you are handing over your life's records for them to dig through and make sure that you're suitable. So, I, you know, in this instance, again, I view this as this really is the lane that the casino industry owns and operates in. And on a state by state basis, it becomes increasingly more difficult, I think, for those bigger companies and those bigger media companies to go through those licensing processes. Now, I think the big question remains then is if the Wire Act 
the federal law that's in place right now that does not allow for internet sports betting over state lines were to be taken away, is that then an enticement where you see some of those bigger telco companies wanting to get in the space? Yeah. Hmm. Let's talk leagues for a second, Scott, for NBA fans who are, who are out here. How do you see, let's say five years from now, how do you see the, this essentially advent of a new industry affecting both your game and also the way fans interact with the NBA? Well, at, we are obsessed with the fan experience wherever it may be. You know, we work with our, our teams to make sure that the live game presentation is best in class. We work with our broadcast partners to make sure that our broadcast is presented in the right way. We work with our apparel manufacturers to make sure that our, our jerseys and our t-shirts are styled right and are representative of our brand. And we know that fans, uh, as regulated sports betting rolls out, they're choosing this as one of the ways to engage with our brand. And so it's important for us to be involved and to be working together with the industry to make sure they're having the best experience. You know, the official data is part of that to make sure they're getting live, accurate, real-time data to ensure that the information is accurate and timely, um, which is especially important given how big in-play betting is overseas, and we expect that to come over here, that the speed and accuracy is essential. You know, we want to license our marks and logos to create a more authentic product. You know, we think the days where you look at a sports board and it says pro basketball, BOS, and CLE, you know, we think those days should be over. And we, we our fans want to have an authentic experience, just like our fans don't wear generic blue and orange T-shirts with a basketball on them. And, you know, they play NBA 2K instead of generic basketball 2019. Um, I think when they start engaging in this, in this activity with our brand, they're going to want that same authentic experience. And so we certainly agree there are fan engagement opportunities, uh, but we want to make sure that's done in an authentic way. And, and Don, for deals that happen in sports outside of gaming, Right, whether it's you know the Fox has regional sports networks sure. that are for sale, uh, the NFL, the Carolina Panthers just sure. sold for over two billion dollars. How much does this opportunity kind of factor into those? It's a, it's a big, it's, a, it's an issue. I mean, it's not an issue. It's, a, it's something that people look at for mm. sure. You know, when we're talking about these RSN sale, there's clearly an opportunity for just forget whether you go and try and launch some sort of uh, betting site, just advertising. Right, the, you know, if you look at if those of us in New York, you watch MSG or the Yes Network. It's not a lot of interesting advertising on there. It's a lot of <laughs> local lawyers and dentists and uh, benefit halls. To actually have an MGM or Caesars uh, plug in with some advertising is real dollars. As it relates to the teams, look, more money coming into the ecosystem of sports just raises the values, right? Because at the end of the day, the teams are the IP and the content. And so it's going to increase values for sure. Is there a rough percentage that you think once, let's say we have 45 states on board and there's vibrant sports so it's a, betting it's here. A big, it's hard to say what the number is, I think, because the, the impact is direct and in, indirect, right? So there's you know, the fees that the NBA and other leagues will get through via royalties, but there's also just the engagement, right? So the next time the NBA is going out to negotiate their, their, their broadcast deal, their ratings will be high. The NFL, their ratings will be high, so they'll get bigger numbers. So it's hard to really put a direct, mm. a direct percentage number, but I think it does bode well for the future valuation of those mm. franchises. I would just add to that. We, we did a study with um, Nielsen Research a couple months ago, and it was based off 100 million people. And so we estimate that the market for the leagues is, the four major leagues, is about $4.2 billion. But you have mm. to get to that 100 million population consumer number. So... And it, and it, How many it goes, states is that roughly? Depending uh, on which states, it probably is ten to yeah, exactly. It would yeah. really depend on the state. But you know, the other thing that's really interesting about this is it's not just the advertising from the gaming companies; it's the consumers that were driving then to watch these sports and the lift that all those other consumers are, or those advertisers are going to get from our fan base. Yeah. So it's it's a so now you have other brands that are coming and they want to understand then. Yes. Who are these people that want, who are going to engage now more, watching more sports? Are they people that we are trying to also advertise to as well? Which of those two buckets is, is generally bigger? Is it the direct advertising dollar or is it the fan engagement boosting? Dollar? I think it, probably the fan engagement I think, okay. is, is bigger. Yeah, and I, I would say that you know we certainly think there's going to be benefits to our business. Um, we, we do agree with the fan engagement point. Our, we know that people who choose to engage in this activity uh, generally watch more games and engage with our brand more, read more articles. And I think there's a lot of money to be made on both sides. You know, I think clearly the casinos are going to generate billions of dollars in incremental revenue as well. So if we can do this in the right way, I think there's incremental revenue for everyone. On the topic of advertising, I think anyone who watched sports a couple of years ago couldn't avoid 
DraftKings and FanDuel, the, the advertising onslaught that those two companies went through as they were trying to kind of beat each other to market share. Is that what the future that we can expect in, in states where, you know, this is legal in, in the next couple of years? I think that is, is something that every, the whole industry needs to learn from. And but yeah. both from what happened in 2015 with daily fantasy companies and as well as what happens overseas sometimes where you see advertising get out of hand and then restrictions are placed and maybe it goes too far the other way. And I think that's incumbent on the leagues, the broadcasters, the gaming industry to all work together to have sensible rules. And, you know, we'll certainly place some some rules and restrictions on our broadcasters about you know not doing it too often and and i, I expect the gaming industry will, will do i'll do the same so i, I Sorry think it's your head Sarah. yeah <laughs> I, we've i mean we've already started we've already taken those steps i think i would say the main difference and by the way i use this example all the time is the the dfs and not wanting to make that mistake again and again you pointing to global italy has banned sports betting advertising they've restricted it in the uk australia same thing so you know, we don't want to make those mistakes. The difference between 2015 and the gambling industry is that there are already books, there are already laws on the books in the states that ba that have certain restrictions on gambling advertising, because DFS was sort of floating behind the, or underneath the radar that we're not gambling, and so these laws don't really apply to us. That that certainly isn't the case for us. But in addition to the laws that we have to follow, we're actually going to implement our own self-regulatory advertising restrictions as well. So in addition to that, on top of it. We're going to put another layer of protection. What would those just, look like? Uh, yeah, just ahead. one thing yeah. on that. A lot of the deals that I'm working on are actually to get customer acquisition costs down. Mm. Right. So they're saying, okay, if I partner with a media company, is that a way of avoiding the onslaught of advertising? If I partner with a European online person who's a company who's good at digital marketing, is that a way for me to avoid what happened in 2015? Yeah, interesting. Interesting. What, what do those restrictions look like? I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're simple, simple common sense. We actually looked at the beer industry as, mm -hmm. a, as a good model to replicate. So not putting minors in advertising, you know, having res uh, reasonable restrictions on college campuses. So a lot of common sense things, but at least getting out in front of it to say, this is what we want to do. I think another area in which we do need to cooperate from a larger stakeholder standpoint is on content. You know, how many, how many shows are there going to be now talking about what the odds are, who's hurt or who's not hurt. I mean, so there's a whole plethora of issues that I know that we're going to be able to work on together as, as stakeholders. We've only got about a minute left, unfortunately. But I, I do want to ask, kind of looming in the back of all of this is the federal <laughs> government and uh, the, the likelihood or lack of likelihood that they may eventually step in and kind of take this state-by-state -state pat patchwork and, and toss it. Um, am I correct in thinking that that is a, a far cry and, and, and extremely unlikely? Well, from our perspective, it continues to be our preference, again, mm. just for consistency standpoint across the states. But it, it, it doesn't appear very likely from our perspective. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I agree. I mean, yes, in a perfect world, if we could do it all over again, would we want one simple regulatory framework? Absolutely. But that's just not the reality of how gaming has been administered and will continue to be administered. There'll be bills I'm sure you'll see in the next couple of weeks that will drop. There'll be hearings probably next year, early next year. But as far as real momentum for over now, the court already said this is a state's rights issue. So I just don't see a lot of appetite for members of Congress to kind of intervene and say, oh, no, 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 this is really a federal issue that we need to deal with. Right on.